Thank you for joining us for another great service at First and LR. I'm honored that you have set aside part of your week to be with us. If you enjoy watching the service, you'll love it even more in person. We would love for you to come and spend a weekend in a service with us and introduce yourself in the guest center. You can learn more about service times and other ways to connect at firstnlr.com. I'm praying that today's message speaks to you and I'm believing for God to do marvelous things in your life. Thanks for watching. It's fun when someone else pays, but when it's your hard earned money, you make absolutely sure that what you buy is worth what you pay. Even better, you'd like it to be worth more than you paid. The next best thing to someone else paying is if you can get it on sale. The goal is a discount, to pay less than something's worth. That's the definition of consumer success. Get more for less. The lower the price, the better the deal. Because you paid less than it used to cost, you look at your great deal and you say, totally worth it. Third principle, the more you love, the more you give. You remember the first time you fell in love? Some of you are still there. When you're head over heels, you express it any and every way you can. If she says, that restaurant sounds amazing, you take her. You don't worry about what it costs because you love her. If he says, I really want those shoes, but they're too much, you go back to the store and buy those shoes because you love him. You go far beyond your budget and way too far in debt for an engagement ring because you love her and you want to show it. You're so in love, you don't think about the cost. The relationship makes you happy to spend. Cindy and I have two grandkids, Evie and Maverick. We're, we're just like you. If you're a grandparent, we love to buy them stuff, crazy stuff, stuff they don't need. We buy Paw Patrol and Sonic the Hedgehog and Walkie Talkies and stuffed animals and toys and clothes and a hundred pairs of earrings. The list goes on and on. We buy it because we love them. The more you love, the more you give. I never thought I would be a cheesy grandparent buying all that stuff, but now it's awesome. I love to, instead of spending money on my kids, to spend it on my grandkids. It's awesome. I look at Tyler and Parker and say, I hate that you're not gonna be able to have anything for Christmas this year, <laughs> but there's a new object of my love. Value and worth is a funny thing. In many ways, it's entirely subjective. What's worth it to you is wasteful to someone else. What's valuable to you is worthless to them. When your friend spends $30,000 on a boat, you say, what a waste of money. I can't believe he spent that on a boat. But you spent more than that on your deer lease, or a home theater, or an outdoor kitchen. Their whole family takes a 10-day Disney World vacation. They stay on property, get the VIP passes, the whole deal. And you wonder, how could they spend that much on a vacation? That's crazy. Then you walk outside of your new house, climb into your new SUV, and go to the store to buy more new clothes. You criticize someone else's value decision, and you defend your own. Their purchase isn't worth it, but your purchase makes complete sense. Worth and value are directly tied to what matters most to your priorities. You can say all you want about your priorities, but if you let me look at your checkbook or your online banking statement or credit card bills, I can tell at a glance what really matters to you. Value is a decision. You choose what matters most. You decide what you're going to value. Those decisions guide your spending habits. When I was a kid, my grandfather got me started on coin collecting. I poured through piles of coins and I knew which ones were valuable because I had the official red book that told me what someone was willing to pay for the coin. I'd look at a coin and I'd see what the red book says. I'd say, this is valuable. I didn't know the value until I looked in the book. Worth is determined by what someone else is willing to pay. Those are normal this world principles when it comes to worth and value. The best deal of all is when someone else pays, consumer success, and we get more for less. The more you love, the more you give. 
worth and value are tied to priorities. You decide what you're going to value, and worth is determined by what someone's willing to pay. Now, I want to show you something. Those principles apply not only to your purchases and money, but also to the kingdom of God. Determining your worth is done the same as anything else. Worth is determined by what someone's willing to pay. God settled the question of your worth when he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God loves you so much that he sent his only son, Jesus, to come to earth as a man, to live a perfect, sinless life, and then to die on a cross, not for his sins, but for yours. Jesus established the value of a soul, of every soul, when he gave his life on the cross. Your value has been established. You are worth the price of God's only son. When people call you worthless or when you feel beat down, remember, you're incredibly valuable to God. I love Psalm 139, verse 17. How precious are your thoughts about me, O God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. You are precious to God. And because you're precious to God, you're precious to us. We value you because he values you. You matter to God, so you matter to us. Second principle, the more you love, the more you give. Giving is the proof of love. Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It was a powerful demonstration of love. Before you ever made the decision to do right or to follow Jesus, you were already loved. You might say, well, I have a hard time believing that. After all I've done, why would God love me? How could God love me? Regardless of, of what you think, God proved it by sending a son. The motivation for that act was love. The more you love, the more you give. A few minutes ago, you all agreed with the statement, the best deal of all is when someone else pays. Well, that principle is huge in the kingdom. Romans 6, 23 says, the wages of sin is death. That's the cost, that's the price for sin. In order to pay the price for your sins, what you deserve is to die. Without the cross, that would be the price. But there's a second half to that verse. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. It's a gift. I have here a Every Soul Matters to God a hoodie. Let's see. I want to give this to, and I want to give you a hoodie. Here you go. There you go. If it's the wrong size, you can trade it. Now, what did Anna just do to get that hoodie? Absolutely nothing. What do I expect Anna to do because I gave her the hoodie? Nothing. It was a gift. It was a free gift. All she had to do was receive it. She had to hold out her arms, catch it, and take it. The gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Instead of paying for your sins, Jesus paid the price. You don't do anything to earn it. You don't deserve it. It's a free gift. You just have to receive the gift. And it's as easy as just saying, Jesus, I accept the price you paid on the cross as the price for my sins. I put my trust in the price you paid. The, the principles mean so much more when you see them in light of God's love and the price Jesus paid for you. Worth is determined by what someone is willing to pay. The more you love, the more you give. The best deal of all is when someone else pays. Then, when you've received God's free gift, the other three principles are your response to that gift. Titus 2.11 says, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. The gift of God, salvation through Jesus, is available to all men, anyone, everywhere. That's why we give a significant percentage of our income as a church and as individuals to reach around the world. Consumer success is when you get more for less. 
But in the kingdom, true success is not when you give more for less, it's when you're willing to give it all. In God's kingdom, success is sacrifice. Now, sacrifice isn't popular. In the world's view, sacrifice doesn't make sense. When you sacrifice, you don't get more for less. It's the opposite. You get less for more. You give something up. You do without. You sacrifice. Often instead of sacrifice, we negotiate with God. Let me show you what I mean. God says, I want you to give $1,000 in that offering. You sense that. You know that. And what you say is, God, I don't, I'm not sure you're with, with the times. There's a lot of inflation. Gas costs a lot. Green beans are expensive. Uh, God, $1,000 is a lot of money. So I tell you what, God, I'll give you 100 That's a really good gift. I'll give you 100 And then when the bucket comes by, you say, <laughs> I'll make it 150 And then you call that extra 50 sacrifice. That's not sacrifice. That's disobedience. In America, we are rich, spoiled, and entitled. We view comfort as a right. We don't often sacrifice because we don't want to do without. In fact, if we don't get our way or what we want, we quit. But the Bible calls us to sacrifice. And all over the world, people sacrifice for the cause of Christ. Burkina Faso is one of the poorest countries in Africa. The land is dry. The water is scarce. The Bolinga Bible School is in a remote rural part of the country. People have limited access to electricity. Water comes from stagnant cow ponds and wells which have to be hand pumped. Most of the people live in mud and stick huts. They live off the land. At the Bible school, life is simple. Those with farming schools tend to the garden, while others take care of the goats and donkeys. In one room of the school, students have built mud brick partitions so each family can have their own living space. It's primitive, but God's doing great things. School is surrounded by unreached people groups in the area, and, and those groups have been targeted by the national church. There's now 90 students in the school when they graduate, each of the students will go to one of those villages and they will plant a church among the unreached. Many of them have already started. They ride their bikes, they hitchhike, or they walk many kilometers to go back and forth and come study at the Bible school. They plant churches in small bush village where the gospel has never been preached. Places steeped in spiritual darkness and dominated by satanic powers Places where they and their families are hated and persecuted. They go because they have decided that people hearing about Jesus is priceless. I want to introduce you to just one of them, Matthew. He was born and raised in Bortur, a Fulani village where people worship and serve the devil who they call Oburu. People are afflicted by demons and disease. Priests put curses on people and people die Demons speak to people through other people. For decades, Oburu, Satan, was the only power in Bortur. The people were afraid of Oburu and anyone who served him as priest. They knew there must be a good spirit somewhere, but they had no idea who he might be. So even though they recognized Oburu was evil, they served him. Matthew was a dedicated follower of Oburu. But one day he saw a girl from another village and wanted to marry her. He learned that her family had recently become followers of a spirit that Matthew had never heard of, a spirit named Jesus. And the girl's family told him, you can't marry our daughter if you serve Oburu. You have to serve Jesus. Matthew was sad because she was beautiful and he loved her, but he served Oburu. And then he got sick, so sick that his strength was gone. He couldn't move. People came and prayed to Oburu for Matthew's healing. Nothing happened. They tried everything they knew to try. Matthew was near death. When a Christian pastor coming through the village came in the home and prayed for Matthew in Jesus' name, and Matthew was immediately healed. 
The next day he renounced Oberu and threw all the idols out of his house. And then God spoke to Matthew in a dream and told him to go to Bible school to be a pastor among the Fulani people. Matthew obeyed. As a student, he's being discipled and trained to be a pastor, and he's not alone. The girl he saw earlier is now his wife. And together, they plan to plant a church in Matthew's home village. Matthew said this, I want to be an instrument to bring people to Jesus. Someone came all the way to my home when I was dying to tell me about him. Therefore, I have a duty to do the same for others with the power of Jesus. Without the power of Jesus, they can't be free. Matthew doesn't consider it a sacrifice. He's simply responding to God's love by sharing it with others. In Mogadishu, Somalia, people who decide to follow Jesus pay a high price. They're fired from their jobs. They're kicked out of their families. They're forced to leave their homes. There are approximately 300 believers in the city in an average month, five of those believers are killed. In Kefala, Sudan, when a group of men were arrested for sharing their faith, the woman who was with them began sobbing, not because they were taken away, but because she was not considered worthy to be persecuted. One of the pastors said, if we die, we should die for the right thing. If we die, we die for Christ. In another city in Sudan, a former Muslim, who's now a believer, has no church, doesn't own his Bible, he, he calls a pastor in another city once a week, and the pastor reads the Bible to him over the phone. If caught, they would both be put in prison or killed. And the pastor said, it's not love if I ask, if I help this person, what will happen to me? It is love if I ask, if I don't help this person, what will happen to him? Paul wrote, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. Each of you should not look just to your own interests, but the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. That's pretty challenging, pretty high bar. We're supposed to have the same attitude as Jesus. So what was Jesus' attitude? Who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. That's the attitude we're supposed to have. Jesus left heaven and came to earth. We're supposed to follow that example. Radical, selfless sacrifice. But then God calls you to sacrifice. There's a special offering to share his love with people who've never heard. Or God calls your children to missions. Or your pastor asks you to make a commitment and give money to missions every week. And you say, well, hold on a minute. I'm not ready for that level of sacrifice. Our response to God's love should be to sacrifice, to do whatever Jesus asks, whatever it takes to share his love, because Jesus is worth it. And other people discovering his love is priceless. Sacrifice is a question of priorities. What will you give up Will you give up what you want for what someone else needs, for what God commands? For the typical person, here's their priority, priority order. Here's how they make decisions about spending. Let's see, we'll, we'll say typical. They start with, number one, top, what I want. After want, they go to number two, what I need. Number three, what someone else needs. Because I'm not going to take care of your needs 
until I've taken care of all my wants and needs. You get a little bit of leftover. And then finally, number four on their list is what God commands. And if there's enough left after I do the other three, then I do what God commands and might even call that sacrifice. That's the typical priority order of a person. But for the kingdom first believer, that order is flipped. And now number one is what God commands. Number two is what others need. Number three is what I need. And then finally, number four, if there's anything left, it's what I want. Do you see the difference? We can't claim to be kingdom minded and following the example of Jesus if our number one priority is what I want. And finally, at the end, if I got any money left after I take care of that, what God commands. The kingdom-minded believer is following the example of Jesus. First is always what God wants, and secondly is always what others need. The order is completely flipped. Now, can you imagine the impact of your life if you lived this way? How would that affect your financial decisions? How would that affect where you spend your time? How would that affect how you share? Can you imagine a whole church full of people who lived according to those priorities? What could they do? What kind of impact could that kind of church make for the kingdom? In 2022, we will give somewhere right around $3 million to missions. That happens when a bunch of people live according to kingdom first priorities. It's not a question of money. It's a question of value and worth and priorities. Some of you have never made a commitment to missions because you're on this side. And giving to missions would mean I'm gonna miss out on what I want or what I need. And I can't imagine making that decision just so someone could hear about Jesus. That's a misplaced priority. You can determine someone's priorities by where they put their time and money. That's why it has the greatest worth and value to them. You decide what you're going to value. My prayer for you is you won't make that decision based on emotion, but rather on the truth of God's word, that your decisions will be influenced by his love, his sacrifice, and his gift. It's true for you as an individual. It's true for us as a church. We choose what we value. Where we put our time and money sends a message about priorities. There's a card in your bulletin. Looks like this, maybe a different picture. I want you to take that out. If you're watching online, you can find it at firstnlr.com slash pledge. Every year in October, we make commitment to missions, but we'll give over the next 12 months. And each of you decide... Where on your priority list, sharing Jesus with others falls. The money you give weekly or monthly goes to supporting more than 223 ministers and missionaries in 92 countries. We take no administrative expense out of your missions dollar. Every penny of your money you give to missions goes to missions. Now, Cindy and I, we don't consider giving to missions a sacrifice. We simply see it as applying God's priorities to our finances. We don't see it as optional. We think it's commanded Jesus to share his love. And we prioritize what others need over what we want. We started years ago by giving $5 a week to missions. And every year we increase it by at least five bucks. 
We started small, but we've been doing it long enough. We now give a significant amount of money to missions each year, and we're increasing our commitment again because sharing the love of Jesus matters, and we've decided to apply kingdom priorities to our finances. We have a crazy goal, incredibly aggressive. Over the course of our life, we want to give a million dollars in missions. We're not there yet, but the only way we'll ever get there is by keeping it a central priority in our life, in our finances. And you say, Pastor Rod, just think what you could do. Think of the retirement you could have. If you had that million dollars, yep, there you go. You're right back in this way of thinking, aren't you? We have this crazy thought that if, if we will live according to this, that then we get to enjoy this promise. God takes care of us. See, now, if you live this way, you're on your own. But what a beautiful promise. He takes care of you. I challenge you to join us and a large percent of our, our church family, not everybody, but a big percentage, and make a commitment to missions. Start with at least $5 each, and then every year raise that. 20, 30 years from now, you'll be stunned how much you've given and the impact you'll make. My goal is that no one is a zero, that everybody does something, even if it's just a buck a week. Start the journey of making it a priority. There's also a line on the card for you to write the name of the person you're going to share Jesus with in 2023, and we're going to pray with you that that person responds and accepts Jesus. And listen, need you to fill out the card. If you say, well, I give the missions, I just don't like filling out cards. So that's a problem because we make commitments to ministries and missionaries based on the commitments you make. So fill out the card just a second when the ushers come, drop it in or submit it online. And together, as we live according to kingdom first principles, it's going to be awesome, the kingdom results of what we do. Would you bow your head? What an incredible service. Thank you for joining us and being a part of our church family. If you have any questions about today's service, if you need prayer, or if you just want to learn more about First NLR, go to firstnlr.com or follow us on social media at First NLR. Our goal is for you to be a lifelong follower of Jesus. And I pray that the Lord would bless and guide you as you obediently follow what He has for you and your family. We look forward to connecting with you.